for child abuse. Abused by her nanny. Child abuse. You clicked on this video thinking I was going to talk about trauma as a kid and health outcomes as an adult. But no, yeah, that's true. And we'll talk about what that is and what happens in the brain in the process. But you probably didn't know that I was also going to tell you that if your mom suffered from trauma as a child, there's 2.5 more risk that you develop persistent depressive symptoms. We're going to talk about how that last part makes sense at the end of the video. So make sure you stick around for it. Hey, you guys, I'm Dr. Danny, a medical doctor here. Just wanting to raise awareness in the mental health and teach you guys what I know. So let's get started. I want to tie in all these things by starting with an experiment they did with rats. I know it sucks. Poor rats. But so they experimented with rats and their newborn pups. Mm -hmm. Cynical. On cage A, they allowed the mothers to tend to their babies. While on cage B, they took the mothers away from the pups for a period of time and then analyzed the differences. They took blood samples of the pups and saw that cortisol levels in the abandoned pups were much higher than pups with their mothers. After putting the mothers back in the cage B, they saw them licking and grooming the pups much more than the mothers of cage A almost as a compensatory behavior. They checked the baby's cortisol level again and saw it gradually drop the baseline levels, same as pups in cage A. The pups from both cages grew up to be sociable, happy rats. But then they took the experiment a step further. They had a new set of rats on cage A and B, but this time the mothers were taken away forever in cage B. As you'd expect, babies in cage B showed higher levels of cortisol, and when they grew up, the rats were anxious and didn't socialize. What's even crazier is that when female rats raised in cage B had pups, they engaged in less licking and grooming than normal, which started a generation of rats that were less sociable, more hypervigilant. And at the time of them having their own babies, they licked and groomed less, just like their mothers. But here's the plot twist. When those hyper-stressed, anti-sociable female rats were placed in cages with normally loving rats, they learned and adapted the grooming style to licking and embracing more often, which led to the start of a new generation of rats that responded better to stress, related sociably, and nurtured their own offspring with more care and affection. We're not cooks, but we are family. Okay, but those are rats, and we all know that rats are on the same as humans. Yes, that's definitely true, but I think we can learn a lot from these studies. Before I get into that, I do want to acknowledge that this is a very sensitive topic. If you're listening right now and you've been a victim of any type of trauma or abuse, I want you to know that it's not your fault. You didn't do anything to deserve that. In the following sections of the video, I will explain the neurobiological and generational effects of trauma. I will be attempting to compress many years of research into bite-sized pieces, and I feel like to communicate complex topics in an efficient manner, it's best to do so with examples, analogies, and jokes. Just know that by no means am I making light of this topic. All the opposite. There are many neurobiological effects, but today I will only talk about one effect. Cortisol. Everything starts with a stressor. The stressor can be getting robbed, having a burglar kick in the door and stealing your new 4K TV. The stressor can be a job issue, discussing with your best friend, a breakup, or for what concerns this video, it can be cases of trauma or abuse. This stress triggers the brain to wake up and be alert. In some cases, to either fight or run the heck away. How does the brain do this? Well, it does so by initiating a cascade of events that lead to the release of cortisol. So if it weren't for cortisol, among other things, we would not enter that adrenaline mode of having more strength than you thought or running faster than you normally could or feeling less pain all of which are great things to have if you're in danger, but it's also the cause of being shaky, nervous, and sweaty. Uh, I, uh, I am a compy nerd. What's up? And over the course of the years, if the stressor is sustained, it can have lasting consequences. So here's how the cascade of events lead to the release of cortisol. Stress signals the hypothalamus right here in blue to release the first hormone, and we'll call it hormone A. It's actually CRH, but whatever. Each hormone is like a key that fits into a specific lock. Hormone A goes from the hypothalamus in blue over to the anterior pituitary in green, where it attaches to the corresponding lock. This attachment induces the production and the release of hormone B, which is ACTH. 
Then the hormone B comes out of the pituitary and over to the gland right above the kidney called the adrenal gland. Here, hormone B attaches itself to the corresponding lock and induces the production and release of hormone C. Cortisol. Que por fin, madre, el cortisol. Finally, cortisol. Cortisol now attaches itself to cortisol receptors, or aka corresponding locks, all over the body. And this is the HPA axis, or the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Please keep in mind that these effects are all part of normal physiology if stressor events are temporary. A little stress is normal, even necessary to grow and mature. But if it's chronic, unstoppable stress, it'll have negative health effects. Now, we could talk endlessly about the effects of a dysregulated HPA axis, but let's zoom in specifically in people who unfortunately go through trauma early in life. Remember how cortisol in the pups increased when they didn't have their mothers? Well, the same thing happens to kids when they cry and aren't attended to, or worse, if they are treated harshly. But now think about this. The brain of kids and babies are still developing so they are neurologically mature, but neuroplasticity is at its absolute peak, which is why they learn and adapt so fast. But unfortunately, if they are forced to learn and adapt in a hostile environment, the brain development will reflect just that. They will grow to have a hyper-aroused attention to danger and adapt to be more suitable to that environment. But at the same time, as they grow older, they'll be constantly on the lookout for threats and friends and family and have higher risk for depressive and anxiety disorders, as well as a wide range of other psychiatric and medical conditions. In relation to cortisol, though, this happens because kids become sensitized, which carries over into adulthood. In other words, even years after the initial trauma, upon mild stress or memories of trauma, cortisol shoots up as if it were a threatening situation. Remember the baby's brain at the time was only trying to adapt to the threatening environment, but now that previous threat does not exist. So it's harder to readapt and relearn. It's harder, but it's not impossible. Among other things, proper support group, friends, and a loving community along with professional help if necessary can really improve symptoms over time. Let's look back at the rat experiment for a sec. The abandoned female pups grew to be hypervigilant and distant from others. Later, they became mothers and they treated their babies indifferently. And then those babies grew up to be anxious, aggressive, and socially withdrawn. And the cycle would eventually repeat itself. So again, that's the case for rats. Ain't nobody be caring about no rats. What happens in humans? Right, humans are very similar. There's a longitudinal research that studied the kids of abused mothers when they themselves were little. I'm going to read the conclusions of the article and then I'll give you a quick analysis of what happened. The conclusion says, Childhood abuse adversely affects the mental health of the victim's offspring well into adulthood. But look at this. Improving maternal, mental health, and parenting practices may reduce offspring risk or depressive symptoms in these families. Again, problems have solution, you guys. Here's the analysis. The study found that offspring of abused women had higher risk for persistent depressive symptoms that lingered even into their adulthood. But why? There are at least three possible reasons. Reason number one, the abused mothers have poor mental health that makes them insensitive to their kids' needs. Reason number two, abused mothers, not always, but they tend to have their babies in the midst of environments related to depression, such as divorce and lower socioeconomic status. And reason number three, Abused mothers are more likely for their kids to also be abused. After adjusting for many other variables, this article calculates a high percentage of associated attribution, mainly to reason 1 and 3. It's not very clear to me exactly how they calculated that risk or the p-values associated, but whatever. <laughs> for the sake of this video, that does not matter. The point is they found very valuable information over the course of 21 years. And those 21 years paid off because we can now value the importance of screening pregnant women for abuse. You guys, that's all. There's a bunch that I wanted to talk about, but ended up cutting things out because it was too scientific or technical. But hey, please let me know if you'd like me to dive deeper. I'll be more than happy to do so in future videos. And I'd love to talk to you guys about the neurobiology of attachment, for example, but maybe for another video in the future, if you guys let me know in the comments, no, seriously, it really helps me out a lot if you guys comment, even if it's a hello. And I'd like to respond back a hello and get to know you guys a little more. But 
I want to finish off by saying that when neglected mother rats were placed in an enriched environment, mothers learned to nurture their kids and love them. And I believe the same can happen to us if we help each other out. If we see someone that is hurting, let's go help. Be a friend. Let's love one another. And listen, yes, even as an adult, there might be lingering effects of trauma, but healing is possible. Nurturing relationships help. Loving friends help. Therapy and seeking professional advice helps. Asking for help is important. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find.